So, welcome to our second class to, of <laughs> English 220, section 005, uh, Deviations. Deviations is the sort of thematic title uh, I've given to, uh, to this course. I've asked you to read for today, and uh, you can find it online. The poem title is right here, John Milton's On Shakespeare, 1630. And you can see I've given a bit of a subtitle here in the, the PowerPoint presentation, which is just really a set of uh, pictorial slides, uh, Monumentality, Canon, and Time. So we're going to think about these issues a little bit. Monumentality, monuments perhaps? Monumentality, Canon, and Time. I ended off last day on the other video asking you to think about what constitutes a canon, what constitutes a canon. It's a key issue for thinking about both the structure of this course and for what it is that works on the course are attempting to accomplish or attempting to do. Uh, in many ways, and we can see this in this Milton poem we're going to talk about today, uh, these writers are trying to inscribe themselves into what retrospectively, a little bit later on, became understood as the English literary canon. If I were there, in person and not on video, I would ask you for uh, some feedback right now. I'd ask you to uh, maybe give some of your responses if you did take a moment and uh, think about what it is that uh, constitutes a canon, if you've run into this term before. Uh, so uh, maybe just recall those in your mind and then we can talk about them in person uh, on Monday uh, after I've returned. But uh, nonetheless, um, think about those ideas right now. Think about what it is that you understand or might understand as a canon. Perhaps you've never run into the term before, so uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a definition. It comes to us, to our usage, um, really from a kind of theological context. When we talk about being canonized, for example, or belonging to the canon, we're talking uh, often, in a common way, you would hear it in the media if it does occur, uh, about saints, about being uh, given a sainthood. Uh, beatified would be the right term. Uh, belonging, in other words, to a highly select, elite group of individuals who have accomplished something that really matters in a particular religious context. Saint so-and-so uh, is uh, emblematic or uh, exemplary uh, of, of the values of conduct, of uh, the ideas that a particular faith or a particular belief system uh, embodies. So, we want, uh, and, and wants you to enact. This is a person who, um, who lives the life, uh, a perfect life in some sense. Now, how does it get uh, appropriated or shifted over into um, a literary context? We speak of canonical texts as texts that are somehow great, that belong on a list of works that are essential knowledge, that are, uh, involve you in a kind of what we call cultural literacy, things that you should know, things that you should have read in order to understand who you are, where you come from, how you speak, how you think of um, yourself, uh, how you articulate yourself. They give you the vocabulary and uh, the forms, in some sense, to uh, position who you are. Uh, so canon, uh, in, used in a literary context, refers to that body of work that has been established, by whom you could ask, uh, has been established uh, as relevant, as meaningful, as, um, as key um, to your particular culture, to where it is you come from, as I said. It shapes historically um, how we understand ourselves, whoever we are as a people. And that question of who decides what this is, uh, is really important. In some ways, it's uh, going to be decided by the number of people who have read, uh, read these works in the past by a mass. Uh, these should be works, we tend to think, that uh, everyone has at some point in their um, upbringing, uh, in some point in their education, um, whether in school or outside of it, uh, has encountered and has somehow, uh, these texts have somehow spoken to you. You hear, if nothing else, their titles or you know the name of the author. Everybody, is it fair to say, knows who Shakespeare is. You've heard this name before. Fewer maybe Chaucer, 
Uh, Milton, we're going to look at a little bit today, aspired to be known. He wanted to be great, and this poem, in some ways, is about that aspiration as a young man. Uh, but if you find that you've heard these names before, uh, what you are experiencing is a kind of cano a moment of canonicity, of knowing that uh, this somehow is uh, a crucial text to your culture, to your background. Now, many of us come from different cultural backgrounds in Canada, for example. Um, in England, uh, it used to be, I don't think we can take this for granted now, and maybe even you couldn't take it for granted back then, from uh, whenever we're thinking about, all the way back to Anglo-Saxon times, back to Beowulf. Uh, but we had the sense, at least, that we were a coherent people, that we knew where we come from and where we belong, that we sort of looked the same, we spoke the same, we had similar ideas about how to conduct your life, about what a good life is, uh, we had similar aspirations. Again, whoever this we is, it's in many ways a fiction, a fictional construct, uh, to think about uh, people as a coherent group. But canon, uh, canonical texts tend to link up with that idea, to produce a sense of coherence. As I said, in Canada, because this is largely a settler and immigrant culture, uh, putting aside, um, uh, and uh, this is a difficult thing to put aside, it's a challenging thing to put aside, but for now putting aside, say, um, uh, writing and cult the, the writing and cultures of uh, native people, uh, aboriginal cultures, which are cultures that come from this place, and uh, whose language and, um, and uh, literatures and art are very much tied in with and belong to this uh, particular space. Uh, so if we can put that aside for a moment, um, if Canada is understood as a kind of largely immigrant culture, a colonial or a late colonial kind of set of cultures, and you have the government, uh, federal government for example, using terms like multiculturalism, uh, that um, sense of belonging and that sense of coherence is a little more difficult, perhaps, to establish. Whose background are we talking about? How is it, and this is again the question of uh, who is this we, or who are these people who decide what constitutes canonical literature, um, how does this particular text, set, set of texts, is this particular canon of uh, English language writing that we're encountering in English 220, how does it um, relate to our own backgrounds that may not be Anglo-Celtic, that may not be Anglo-Saxon, we may not come uh, sort of genetically from that particular uh, landscape, from that particular cultural background, we come from elsewhere. Nonetheless, uh, that sense of, um, the fact is that we use, for example, English uh, every day here now. It's the official language, one of two official languages of Canada. So um, the literature of peoples who write in English has a substantive impact on um, how it is that we determine ourselves and shape ourselves culturally. So even if we don't come from this particular cultural background, the sense that we, uh, the, the fact, the given fact that we're speaking English now, that it tends to overwrite that, that those speech patterns tend to overwrite many of the things that we do, uh, produces this sense of belonging, whether we like it or not, and often we want to resist this, uh, of belonging to uh, that particular background. We're connected to it somehow, even if it's not a direct kind of belonging, even if it's a troubling kind of belonging, uh, it's there for us in the language that we use and in the cultural patterns that we've inherited uh, through the colonial uh, sort of machineries of uh, the production of uh, a nation like Canada. Right? It's, it has to do with, uh, this, le this literature, these literatures have to do with how it is that we present ourselves, even if they aren't arguably ours, always. Uh, they aren't a given. The thing I was going to suggest too is that this canon, many of these canonical works, uh, I mentioned this already when I was just talking briefly about The Tempest, uh, oh, that was in the last. <laughs> this is only a few minutes later for me, this video uh, from the previous one. But if you can think back to the Wednesday video, I mentioned The Tempest having something to do with challenging the canon. Sorry about that. Uh, time is a blur. As you'll see, time is also an issue in these, in these texts. Anyway, uh, if you think to The Tempest, uh, if you have read it, or uh, maybe this anticipates it if you haven't, um, there are a number of challenges articulated there to the authority of language. The character of Caliban, for example, uh, suggests that he can use the language English in this case, although it, uh, in the fiction of the play it probably wouldn't be English, but uh, it's an English language play, 
So uh, in the fictional world, it's not, but in the world that we, as we see it, is of course it's Shakespeare's English. Um, uh, Caliban, take Caliban's English is, uh, he said, he says uh, in so many words, uh, has the ability to be turned against uh, his oppressors. He takes his English and throws it back at them poetically and uh, rhetorically, very forcefully, uh, is able to um, uh, manipulate his words so that there is space inside of these um, powerfully monumental canonical works, right? It's, it's as if they're written in stone sometimes. They feel very heavy and very weighty, very difficult, right? They have a great deal of historical moment, right? A lot of weight, as I say. This is a metaphor, but you feel their presence in, in, in a large part. But they also push back at that idea of monumentality quite a bit, and sometimes make it a bit problematic. So um, we are feeling that in The Tempest. Uh, you feel it in Beowulf as we contend with monsters, but also in some sense uh, watch the, the foundations of English language culture crumble. Beowulf's a very tragic poem, especially near its end, as the world seems, we're left in a world that seems to be falling apart. So uh, in a poem that is used to establish the foundations, an origin point in many ways, for English literature, for English literary culture, English language culture, um, it also tends to undermine and to question and to invite us to rethink how it is that we construct ourselves, how it is that we understand ourselves. So the idea of canon and canon formation, uh, I want you to think about it not just as a set of authoritative texts uh, having a kind of almost religious uh, quality about them as greatness, as truth-telling works, not just that, they do have this capacity and they do feel this way often. But I also want you to think about them from your own position here uh, in British Columbia now um, as uh, texts that create problems around the idea of, of canon and canon formation. That ask questions about it and then invite you to ask questions about it. How is it that um, we are asked to conform? How is it that we are uh, invited to deviate from that process of conformity and to critique uh, various forms of cohesion and coherence. So uh, these texts will do both of these things. Uh, in fact, Milton's text, so I'm going to move on uh, to talk specifically about this poem now uh, with these ideas in mind. Milton's text uh, does uh, precisely that. So uh, if you take a look, uh, it, that is, it, it goes in both directions at once. It has two things that it does and uh, both uh, an attempt to establish a certain kind of canonicity, a kind of canonical authority, and also to interrogate, to question the mechanisms and the, the structures by which that authority is um, asserted and claimed. So it has this double-sidedness to it. So the poem, on Shakespeare's 1630, in fact, uh, just to be kind of uh, picky about it, but have a look at the punctuation. It's kind of an odd moment in the title. Things like spelling and punctuation were still in flux in Milton's time. Uh, if you do look on, at the online version of this text that I have uh, connected to on our, web, on our web course website, you'll see that um, uh, the spelling is, uh, du it, it duplicates a version of the text that was published in 1645. The dates are important in Milton's uh, sort of collected poems. Uh, he produced to look back on the first um, first part of his career, uh, so he's in his late 30s in 1645, and this poem, uh, the edition that they're using, comes from that um, from that version. Uh, so um, again, thinking about the dating is important, but uh, uh, the idea of a kind of fluidity or a little bit of instability is a part of how these texts were published. I'll have some images in a second of uh, of what these texts actually looked like in the time. So on Shakespeare's 1630, it's published uh, on the opening pages of what's called the second folio edition, so from 1632. <laughs> Notice the shift in date. So we have 1630, 1632 is when the poem was actually first published, and then it reappears, the version you're having a look at online, and if you do choose that one, is uh, from 1645. So there are different kinds of historical moments that are connected to this poem, worth remembering. Uh, it's the plays of Shakespeare, so a kind of collected plays. Um, I don't know if you know what uh, terms like, you'll see these around Shakespeare's uh, early versions of Shakespeare's, um, of the publication in, in print of Shakespeare's plays, uh, folio and quarto editions. 
uh, it ref this is, these are printer's terms, really, but they've come to be associated with um, how we uh, understand the, the editions of the text. Uh, what a folio is, is just, it refers to the folding of uh, the sheet of, uh, the raw sheet of paper before you printed it. Uh, to make a book, you have to fold paper in certain ways and then cut the edges and then uh, bind the spine so that, um, to make pages. So a folio is just folded once, that's all it means. Uh, so you get um, uh, four, four sides. A quarto is folded twice. Uh, we're not going to look at any quarto editions, but you may run into this term. Uh, so you get, um, if I'm not mistaken, eight pages uh, as, you, uh, as you fold it and before you cut it. So uh, the printer in uh, his or her galley would uh, line up the pages and then could print the sheet and then fold it and uh, make the book. So that's how that was working. So this is the second folio. There had been an earlier collected edition of Shakespeare in 1623. It's worth remembering that Shakespeare uh, was a number of years dead at this point. He died in 1616. So in many ways, uh, this, uh, these collections are retrospective. They're a gathering together of this uh, great theatrical and poetic work and uh, a way of establishing, in fact, Shakespeare's um, already, in an oral sense, uh, his literary presence, his canon, if you want, was being um, uh, produced in print here uh, in these various collected editions. And uh, this is the second folio edition, so the second collected. And Milton's poem appears on, um, sort of, not quite, but on the front page. Uh, he's only 22 years old at this point, and this is his first published poem. So this is the poem of a young man who is uh, I think he's just entering his master's degree, his MA degree at university, but so he had just completed his undergraduate degree. Maybe you can empathize a little bit with him and think a little bit about uh, how old he is when he's writing this text. So 22 years old and his first published poem. Uh, because it's retrospective as well, it's what we call, it's a dedication, but it's also an elegy. An elegy. Now, um, elegy generically refers to poems that are uh, sort of extended meditations on an absent person or object. You can have an elegy on a person or object. Some, someone who is gone, usually who has died, but it can be a thing that you don't have uh, present to you now. So you're meditating often on loss, thinking in an extended way about um, uh, disappearance and absence and uh, what in Shakespearean language would have been called mutability. Mutability, which means change over time change over time. So uh, elegies often address this whole idea of um, our mortality, of the fleetingness of life, and of um, changeability of the fact that things uh, decay. And uh, uh, the idea that scientists would call now en of entropy, entropy, which is sort of the uh, slow um, move of the universe itself toward a kind of state of constant equilibrium. So it's a kind of graying out of things. The sense of things falling apart or falling to rest in times often encountered in elegies, again, meditations on loss, uh, objects and persons. So there's a dedicatory elegy, Shakespeare is dead, it's written to, in his memory, and it's also in many ways about the nature of elegy, the nature of writing, what it is that writing does, both to uh, address loss in time and also to think about permanence in a way. How is it that um, against that sense of mutability, of change or entropy, writing can function to preserve the memory of who someone was and of what someone did? Or more importantly, in fact, for Milton's purposes, to make a sense, to give a sense of the greatness of that writer. Again, this refers to the idea of canon. We're trying to give, uh, to produce a sense of, um, of what it is that is great about um, about Shakespeare's work. Sometimes you take this for granted now, he is uh, such a canonical presence, but you've got to remember in Milton's time, although there's a lot of adulation for Shakespeare, people want to read it, uh, it's a part of that, um, of that world's um, literary scene now. Uh, it's also uh, uh, something that was being established, it wasn't a given. Um, you had to make a case, in some ways, for Shakespeare's greatness, and that's what Milton's setting up to do in this poem. So that's why it appears at the beginning. Um, I'm not uh, entirely uh, confident that I can tell you uh, why it is that Milton uh, is invited as a young man to write his first poem 
at the beginning of the works of uh, a past and established master of the English language. This is a real juxtaposition. Uh, in some ways, uh, it has to do with uh, Milton's own ambition, or it's read this way, that he aspires, uh, a little bit articulated in this poem, uh, but he aspires to sort of displace Shakespeare as the greatest writer in the English language. And uh, he did believe, there's uh, some documentation of this, that his epic poem, Paradise Lost, accomplished just that. It made him the preeminent writer of, uh, in English literature, uh, supplanting Shakespeare, Chaucer, and everything that had come before him. This is what he aspired to. Um, why it is that at this point, as your first piece of published writing, you get in with the, you get a page on the works of the greatest writer uh, in the language. Uh, how it is that this came about? Uh, as I said, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, his father, Milton's father, John Milton Sr., was connected to um, the theater world and uh, had uh, some links to the company of, um, uh, that, that performed Shakespeare's works um, at Blackfriars. So uh, there are some direct connections here, and I guess it was thought that uh, John Milton Jr., our John Milton here, was uh, kind of a hotshot young writer and should be given this opportunity. So again, I'm not entirely confident about that. It's worth uh, researching. There's been some scholarship and biography done on this. Uh, some of the links on our web pages should lead you toward this kind of material. But that's basically, at least in biographical terms, uh, what is going on here. Why is it Milton might have done this? So the poem functions as both a tribute, I'm suggesting, and as a challenge to Shakespeare's poetic or literary authority. Notice the connection in a word like authority uh, to the idea of authors and authorship, right? Uh, that authors, uh, arguably, one of their tasks is to establish their authority, to um, write themselves into some place of permanence or of a meaningful, uh, a kind of meaningful position within their particular cultural uh, context. So um, authors try to produce authority. And authority, I think, is one of the things that's at issue in this poem. Here's a picture of Milton from the National Portrait Gallery in London. Uh, uh, it's a kind of close-up, but this is him at your age. This is <laughs> uh, uh, 1629, so he is uh, 21 at this point, is that right? So, uh, yeah, 21. 22, somewhere around there. This is around the time that he would have composed uh, composed that poem. So he's an undergraduate here, a uh, young man, uh, full of ambition. This is a picture uh, of the frontispiece and the front, the first pages of uh, a copy of the folio. Um, so there's this famous uh, engraving that purportedly depicts Shakespeare. These are the images uh, we have of what he looked like. And then uh, it's a little out of focus here, but uh, it couldn't help but be, but this is, um, uh, notice the title is different, but this is Milton's poem here. So there's another, uh, another dedicatory uh, poem here, uh, and there are other things that are inscribed into the edition, but this is where Milton's poem appeared. So it's one of the first things you would encounter. And notice how he's facing Shakespeare when you close the book. So uh, again, I want to suggest that the poem's a tribute, certainly it uh, says how great Shakespeare is, but it also is a bit of a face-off and a challenge. He's gonna, his poem uh, pushes against Shakespeare and tries to establish who he is. Uh, just because we're doing The Tempest, uh, this is uh, a, a photograph of the, uh, the page from the folio of the first uh, lines of The Tempest. Again, remember a folio. The second folio, the other editions are collections of these plays bound up uh, in a kind of book form. So this is what the first page of The Tempest looks like. This is just for your, uh, for your interest right now. And here's another uh, copy, a little better focus, uh, but I uh, notice someone has written in that the poem is by John Milton. Uh, even though it's trying to establish his presence, in fact, in the original edition, uh, so you can sort of see this a little bit here, but it is in fact unsigned. It's an anon anonymous poem, though uh, I think uh, most would have taken for granted um, uh, that it was by Milton, or would, those who were in the know would have known that. So uh, uh, again, uh, uh, anonymity suggests that he's trying not to write himself into this kind of position of challenge, but uh, uh, I think that this challenge to Shakespeare is there nonetheless. So it's not just an anonymous tribute. And again, you can see that someone has written in who owned this edition. 
don't do this to, your own, to the library books or anything like that, but it's written in his name uh, to identify who it was. Uh, and this is a picture of the, uh, another frontispiece. This is from the 1645 uh, poems of John Milton. Uh, you can see, uh, here's a picture of him, so he's in his late 30s. This is an etching from a drawing. You know, photography at this point, uh, <laughs> point in time, obviously. But that's approximately what Milton would have looked like. Uh, notice he's, um, uh, it's a kind of elitism, a kind of um, um, precociousness in his dress. Uh, there are quotations in Greek. He writes in Latin as well. So uh, there's a, a real attempt in the 1645 poems to show how, um, not just aspirational, but how established a poet. This is before Paradise Lost and before his longer works were composed. To show, to show how established and how a poet and how powerful a voice Milton had become by the mid-17th um, uh, mid century. Uh, and there's, uh, just if you think about how it is, uh, this is typical of the first pages of a, uh, of a book of this time, but um, how it is that kind of visually there are a lot of the trappings of authority here. This is uh, an effort to um, create a kind of canonical presence for this still young writer, this writer who hadn't yet produced uh, the works of, uh, this kind of monumental works that, uh, that we're going to read in, in this course, in fact, hadn't yet done Paradise Lost. But that monumentality is nonetheless hinted at here, and uh, sort of neoclassicism as well, an attempt to position him alongside the great works of Greek and um, Latin uh, literature as another writer for the ages. All right, if we could uh, look at uh, the poem itself now, I'm just going to spend a few moments uh, reading it uh, more directly and looking at some of these issues, and then we'll be done. Uh, I think this lecture will be just a little shorter than usual, but uh, I guess that's a function of film as well. Uh, first thing we could do, in fact, is, uh, I hope, is, um, is read the poem. Uh, what I've reproduced on the PowerPoint here, you should be able, through the media site uh, connection, to look at the PowerPoint slide. Um, I've reproduced the spelling from 1645, so this is not the normalized spelling that happens in, uh, in this edition. In the, um, it's been modernized and we say normalized uh, for, uh, for a reading edition uh, by the editor here. But in fact, um, this is how it uh, originally appeared. It might, this might not uh, be too much of an issue, right? but notice how Shakespeare's uh, name is spelled differently. Uh, there are capitalizations that don't occur here. Uh, a lot of the typographical um, elements in uh, the text suggest these two ideas that I've been trying to talk about. One, a certain instability, right? There's a certain fluidity, as I said, in spelling and in punctuation uh, that you can observe here. It looks a little bit fragmentary. In his time, it wouldn't have, but to us now, in this kind of more, when we have a more standardized sense of uh, the appearance of, of words on the page, uh, it's going to look a little bit choppy. It just does. Um, so there's that idea of, the way I think of this is as a voice trying to sort of find its way. Uh, and uh, the, these marks of instability are um, uh, signals that the text hasn't quite solidified, hasn't quite come to rest, in a sense. On the other hand, um, if you look at it sort of uh, kind of as a whole, there is a really um, powerful sense that this is a monumental text. It looks very square on the page. The capital letters uh, on important nouns, fame, stones, kings, sepulcher, marble, this kind of thing, uh, where they wouldn't normally appear, where they don't appear, in fact, in, uh, in this edition. Uh, they've been normalized out. Uh, the capital letters here suggest importance, suggest this kind of, uh, kind of canonizing power. They suggest authority. Uh, they suggest um, a kind of platonic, Plato, a kind of platonic uh, disclosure of truth somehow. But these are uh, significant, powerful words. And so you feel that monumentality on the page. So there's a fragmentation a little bit, just a little bit, and also this kind of uh, stabilizing and um, uh, marble producing. Marble is one of the words in the poem that, that is important, in fact. The sense of a kind of um, a stone like, uh, a lapidary, say, quality to these words, as if they're engraved uh, on a tombstone, for example, uh, or on a monument. Um, also, uh, exists in a kind of counterpoint 
as I said, to this fragmentation. Uh, another thing to watch for are the periods and the, the sentence structure. Um, it might help, I uh, hope you'll pardon me for this one, but because it's a short text, if you just read it through, so open up your books, or if you've got it in front of you, that's great, I'm just going to read the whole poem, and then comment on a few particular issues, and then uh, we'll be done. So, on Shakespeare, 1630. What needs my Shakespeare for his honored bones, the labor of an age in piled stones, or that his hallowed relics should be hid under a star pointing pyramid? Dear son of memory, great heir of fame, what needs thou such weak witness of thy name? Thou, in our wonder and astonishment, hast built thyself a live-long monument. Okay, <laughs> rather than go through the whole thing and then go back, what if I just stop there for a moment and, uh, and comment a little bit? I have some, um, I'll just move forward in the, in the slideshow here. I have some questions to put to the poem. I've kind of raised some of these ideas already. But uh, I'm going to, uh, so have a look on the slide. Um, and you can put these questions to it or versions of them for yourself as well. I'm going to be circling around these ideas as we read here. So notice, first of all, the repetition of needs, right? Uh, there's some idea of, uh, if you think about neediness, uh, there's some idea of uh, a kind of demand that, uh, that Shakespeare is, whoever Shakespeare is, and that his name is there in the title in the first line, and they know who he is, but whoever he is, um, it's, uh, the question is put, uh, at least implicitly, does he need anything? Is he wanting for anything? Uh, want you may, uh, you may know, is a kind of synonym both for desire and for absence. So if Shakespeare needs something, uh, it's a mark of something being absent from his work or of his own absence. And remember again, elegies, uh, this dedicatory elegy uh, included, elegies are texts that deal with absence and that try and reconcile uh, both the writer and the readers to the fact of absence. How are we going to deal with this? Um, notice that these are questions as well, uh, and they are rhetorical questions. So a rhetorical question is actually a statement, often a negative statement, but a statement in the, in the guise, in the grammatical form of a question, but it's actually a declaration. So what Milton is saying here in the first six lines, notice that there are two extended questions, both of them asking about need. See that? The verb is, in both cases is need. Um, uh, asking, uh, what he's doing is actually s stating rather categorically, even if it is in a question form, that Shakespeare, Shakespeare has need of nothing. Now what is it that he you would imagine he would want here, and it has something to do with a uh, monument. Um, there's an odd phrase in uh, the fourth line, under a star epointing pyramid. Star epointing. Um, uh, that's odd even in Milton's time, and it might feel a little bit uh, awkward to read it. Um, what it is, uh, and you can find this connection uh, in the scholarship online, in fact, uh, at the Dartmouth site that uh, reprints uh, this poem. So take a look there through the connections on our website if you're interested. Uh, but Milton is actually referring here to um, an epigraph on uh, the tomb of um, the Stanley family in England that was thought to be, an epigraph that was thought to be written by Shakespeare. I think Shakespearean scholars of the period are pretty convinced now that it isn't by Shakespeare. Though again, I'm not an expert on Shakespeare, so I couldn't tell you this for sure. This is kind of a small point. But uh, Milton, uh, the thing to recognize is that Milton in this time believed that it was by Shakespeare. And so um, the star you're pointing on the epigraph, it, ha it, it refers to star aspiring pyramids. So it's like he's taken that phrase and rewritten it. So the idea is here that Milton is um, using monumental language. He's using epitaphs that in his time were purportedly written by Shakespeare. He's rewriting in his own mind Shakespearean language. Now you may not think that e-pointing is a better word than aspiring, and it really isn't. It's rather awkward. But the important thing to notice is that Milton's trying to take up Shakespeare and repurpose him. And he's repurposing language written, again, probably not, but in his time he thought it was, written by Shakespeare to monumentalize, is that a good word? To make monumental uh, Shakespeare's own life. So it's like he's, he's carving on a tomb of, uh, of uh, his own making 
uh, some words for Shakespeare and using Shakespeare's uh, vocabulary, uh, repurposing it for him. Um, the thing you should notice, though, is that he says Shakespeare's honored bones, so his body uh, after death, posthumously afterward, does not need pyramids and um, uh, carvings and uh, great tombstones and things like that. Doesn't need it, he says, which, uh, or he implies at least with these rhetorical questions, which uh, might be surprising. You'd think that uh, he would be um, sort of nice about this and he would compose something saying, let this be a monument for the great Shakespeare. Notice also in terms of canon and the idea of canonization, hallowed relics, or that his hallowed relics should be hid under a starry pointing pyramid, hallowed relics. This refers specifically to the idea of saintedness. This is a poem that's exactly about canon formation and canonizing Shakespeare. He's a saint here. So uh, relics were usually, uh, like these bones and other things, were thought to be the parts of the remains of saints. And e even in Milton's time, were said to have um, sort of curative or holy power. Uh, they're uh, holy relics. It's a little bit um, uh, like the Da Vinci Code in some sense, and <laughs> these kind of things. You search for relics, you search for uh, uh, objects that are somehow touched physically with the presence of God. So that's what uh, hallowed relics are, his bones, bits of his body that uh, are saintly. Already again, his canonization is taking place in this poem in religious terms. Milton is making him into a saint of English literature here. Um, one more uh, interesting epithet in here as well, he says, uh, Dear son of memory, great heir of fame, dear son of memory. Uh, that phrase, son of memory, uh, has been uh, reassociated with Shakespeare in a number of contexts. Uh, it's from Milton, but uh, it uh, might not uh, appear at first pass to uh, do the kind of work that uh, it does do, uh, maybe because we don't always hear these kind of references, but it's an allusion to uh, classical Greek mythology. The muses, the nine muses, they're all female, who inspire poets, historians, astronomers. You'll see Milton has a muse in Paradise Lost. It's Urania, the muse of the cosmos, of astronomy. Um, uh, these muses were said to be the daughters of Mnemosyne, the goddess of memory. So what he's done here is shift genders a little bit. Now this is a stereotyping of, uh, of femininity in some ways that a muse is a kind of uh, lovely, uh, erotically charged um, female figure who uh, conspires and ins conspires with and inspires the male poet to uh, great feats of poesy, great kinds of writing, and so on. So there are gender stereotypes in play there. Um, here, you'll notice that instead of the daughters of memory, who are the muses, um, Shakespeare is said to be a son of memory. So it's as if he's a kind of male muse, in a way. Uh, both inspiring those who read him to write again, which is what Milton's doing. He's rewriting Shakespeare, remember? Shakespeare is his muse here, uh, arguably. And also um, uh, being inspired by memory and by the muses. Um, it's also uh, significant that uh, the muses are the daughters of memory, of a kind of cognition from the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, of the way in which the creative mind works. It's inspired by, it's shaped by memory. That's where inspiration comes from in whatever art you practice. Uh, memory is crucial. This is a memorial, this poem, for Shakespeare, and the idea of him being remembered is crucial. So he's a son of memory in a whole bunch of senses. This might have looked like just, a, as I said, a kind of passing phrase, but if you start to unpack its resonances, and think about this classical illusion, this illusion to Greek myth that's going on there in a fairly um, subtle way, you can see how a lot of these issues of canon formation, of inspiration, of um, <coughs> excuse me, of what I would call aff not just me, what we call affect, uh, that is to say, sort of emotional impact, uh, are being uh, all these issues are being raised uh, in this poem, and uh, some thinking is being done about how it is that poems carry on in time and how they impact audiences. In fact, in the next line, after the son of memory question. Uh, just where I stopped reading, thou in our wonder and astonishment, sorry, astonishment, hast built thyself a livelong monument. Where is it that Shakespeare's uh, tombstone, in a way, his monument, or where is it that his um, perseverance 
can sort of locate itself. What is it that sustains his reputation? It's his own works. He builds his own monument. He writes himself into um, permanence, in a way, into prominence, into authority, cultural authority. It's his writing that sustains him and in our memory, that makes him, in, arguably in another sense, a son of memory, that we will always remember him as this important figure. But notice what Milton says, it's not just the typographical bind-ups of Shakespeare's works, but they have to be performed. And maybe that's an excuse for reading Milton aloud here, right? Uh, thou in our, who's this our we're talking about? Wonder and astonishment has built thyself a live long monument. So whoever we are, and I guess that's the literate public, maybe that's Milton. Notice that it, it's not our Shakespeare in the first line, is it? It's my Shakespeare you have kind of individual contention here and a sort of personalizing of uh, this idea of affect, of response, of reader response. That Shakespeare belongs personally and intimately to Milton as a reader. He's mine, as, uh, as Milton says. And this my gets translated as the poem goes along into our. The, the, per, the interpersonal and the singular gets generalized into a multitude, into um, a larger uh, group of people who are reading. Or, hmm, it's not reading, is it? It's listening. It's uh, and watching. These are theater goers who stand uh, on the ground or who sit in the, in the seats in the theater and who listen to uh, and watch a play that's being performed and who are affected by that language and by those performances. What are these the affects? Milton gives you the name of two of them. Wonder, which is, you will see, uh, a, a, a reference to The Tempest. Uh, in fact, uh, people are um, uh, subject to wonder, both the wonder of the appearance of Miranda, Prospero's daughter, and uh, the kind of spellbinding wonder of Prospero's magic. So these states of wonder and astonishment. This is what you feel, Milton says, when you go to the theater, perhaps, or when you listen to Shakespeare's work. You have wonder and astonishment. The word astonishment is interesting here, too, uh, because it... Um, uh, has its actual ento, ento, uh, sorry, its actual etymology, etymology, the roots of words. So in, in the dictionary, you often get etymological, um, uh, etymological um, material. Uh, if you uh, have a look uh, uh, for the etymology of astonishment, you see it comes from the word uh, a word meaning thunder in Latin. So it has to do with being thunderstruck. But it has to do, sound-wise here, so this is a false etymology, a false echo, but it's one that uh, Milton and Shakespeare both would hear, uh, with being sort of struck to, as into a state of stone. So, uh, to go on, I just have a few minutes here, but uh, I'm going to read the rest and think about this idea of being uh, dumbstruck, of being struck and turned into stone. Astonished. For whilst uh, to the shame of slow, endeavoring art, thy easy numbers flow. Easy num uh, numbers refers to metrics, to um, well-crafted lines of poetry. Uh, Milton's poem here is in iambic pentameter. We'll define that a little more carefully when we come to, uh, to Shakespeare. But he's attempting to uh, imitate uh, the Shakespearean line here as well. Uh, rhymed couplets. You can look at the ends of the lines, see the rhymes of iambic pentameter. Um, so those are his numbers, right? He's imitating Shakespearean numbers. And they are easy, they flow. Shakespeare's got flow. And that each heart hath from the leaves of thy unvalued book. I think he's being a little understated there. Uh, he's saying that the book is undervalued, perhaps, that Shakespeare's work hasn't achieved the fame that it deserves, although I think it probably, even in Milton's time, has. Uh, Shakespeare goes through a number of ups and downs over the course of the centuries uh, in the, um, in the uh, late 17th century, a little Toward the end of Milton's time, his reputation starts to fall, and in the 18th century, you have uh, sort of a lowering of Shakespeare's reputation as a playwright. But um, it, does, it is sustained, and it is there, so this is a bit of an understatement that he's unvalued. But it is serving the, the, a function of the poem to think about this idea of value and of valuation. Those Delphic, uh, the Oracle of Delphi, so they're like prophetic or oracular. Those Delphic lines with deep impression took then, thou our fancy of itself bereaving. Again, this is an elegy, so it's um, fancy is imagination. You've take, it's as if you've taken our imagination from itself. We're grieving the loss of imagination in your passing. Dost make us marble with too much conceiving. This again, this idea of astonishment. It's as if you turn us to stone. 
That's a false etymology, right? Again, astonishment refers to thunder uh, in its Latin roots. But uh, if you hear that stoniness and astonish, um, uh, we're sitting there in the audience and it's like we're turned to marble. We're so overtaken here. Too much conceiving. Our brains are working too hard, our poetic brains. Uh, marble is what you make tombs and monuments out of, of course, especially in this neoclassical sense, in the sense of kind of Greek and Roman um, statuary. So he's, he's imagining that Shakespeare's language produces um, these fictional or imaginary uh, marbles around us and that are inscribed with his words. So sepulchred, that's entombed, in such pomp dost lie, that kings for such a tomb would wish to die. So even um, kings, he says, uh, who have the fanciest of all kinds of tombs, would prefer to have a tomb that is a sepulcher, uh, 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 an encasement uh, like that which is produced by your words as we sit and listen to them and sort of are frozen in a state of false death in a way. It's as if we die when we listen to Shakespeare because he's too overwhelming. This is hyperbolic, right? This is hyperbole. This is an exaggeration that's part of the form of poetic elegy. Um, Milton does exaggerate. But nonetheless, look at how uh, he's establishing Shakespeare's canonicity, his presence, his saintliness in uh, the body of English literary works, and he keeps arguing for its value, even if he doesn't have to. Um, the thing to also notice, uh, perhaps, and this is um, in the last minute here we, we might want to think about, uh, in, um, in kind of in Milton's favor, is that, um, he, and against Shakespeare, is that he keeps talking about the constructedness, the madeness of that sepulcher, as he calls it, of those marbles. They're not durable in the sense that they're given, in the sense that they are fixed in time, but they are fabricated in words. Words are constructed things. That's what uh, the roots of poetry, the word poetry, in fact, mean. Boyan in Greek, in ancient Greek, means to make or to construct. So Milton, in his exaggerations, in his artifice, is sort of suggesting that he too can reconstruct and remake Shakespeare. He doesn't just sit there and unspeaking, stand there astonished somehow, but he actually writes poems and rewrites Shakespeare. He dares to take on what he thought was Shakespeare's language and to recompose it. So there's some kind of brash repurposing of Shakespearean work and pushing back at that monumentality a little bit, and maybe trying to piggyback on it as well. All right, to finish, uh, I just have a minute here, but um, <laughs> this might seem like a bit of a, a deviation, but I'd like you to think about the ways in which um, contemporary culture, uh, pop music is a good example of this, but contemporary cultural moments try to inscribe into themselves, not just in the literary context, but maybe visually, film, uh, music, uh, try to inscribe themselves, in, uh, or to ascribe to themselves some kind of monumentality. So um, look at a pop song, maybe that you're fond of. Uh, I've got uh, my own, one of my own favorites. You might think this is a little old school. So, sorry about that, but there you go. Uh, so, I'm a big fan of Bruce Springsteen right now. And Bruce Springsteen, uh, this is a famous song from 1975. Uh, some of you may know it. If you don't know it, don't worry, but uh, you might want to uh, uh, have a listen. So, it's from Born to Run. It's the first song on the album Born to Run. Shakespeare, or Shakespeare. <laughs> Springsteen is a young man at this point, and he's about to get, uh, with the release of this particular record, to get on the cover of Time magazine to achieve a kind of monumentality. So this is the opening lines of a song called Thunder Road, famous song, the screen door slams, Mary's dress waves like a vision she dances across the porch as the radio plays. Notice that there's this kind of sort of uh, poetic, romantic language here. And then the third line of the song, Roy Orbison singing for the lonely, hey, that's me and I want you only. Roy Orbison is uh, a sort of a, here he is Springsteen singing with him, a kind of a rock singer. So if um, a significant one, uh, a rock and roll singer in uh, the sort of emergence of uh, popular uh, pop American pop American music, uh, you know only the Lonely or um, uh, a number of other Roy Orbison songs. So Springsteen's referring to it here, but notice how hey that's me. There's an identification there with Roy Orbison, with who he is, and with what he represents. It's as if he's trying. Uh, in this romantic moment to write himself, as even as he's trying to persuade a young woman to come away with him in his car, with his guitar, or whatever he does, um, he's trying to write himself, reinscribe himself into what he understands as a kind of rock and roll American canon. This is a moment when he's reinscribing his voice over top of Roy Orbison's, and there they are literally singing together, but trying to reinscribe himself, trying to write himself into that canonical American space. 
So have a look at um, Beowulf over the weekend. We'll start reading it on Monday. Uh, think about this idea of reinscription in popular culture, North American culture, Canadian culture, English language culture, and maybe try and find a moment when you yourself uh, have experienced this, uh, this feeling of, uh, of reinscription, of canonicity, and of the assertion of authority. All right, I'm out of time, so uh, take care. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and uh, I will see you on Monday.